Hi, this is Dr. Ryan Kazami, and thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, this presentation is part of our bone modification series for developing sites for dental implants. Uh, total implant success is uh, dependent on a number of factors, including proper diagnostics, 3D digital planning, adequate bone quality and quantity, uh, precise implant positioning, selection of right-sized implants, and certainly uh, following a very uh, strict prosthetic guided uh, treatment protocols. One additional factor which comes with great experience in uh, manipulation of heart tissue is implant site bone modification and management techniques, which is crucial to proper implant healing and uh, stability, both during the healing phase as well as once the implants have been loaded. With uh, so many bone modification techniques and tools that are uh, available, today I would like to discuss the combination of osteodensification and internal sinus lift techniques in a patient plan for implant replacement of his upper um, first molar and demonstrate how we can develop our implant site to achieve a more uh, predictable results. Our diagnostic CBCT in this patient uh, demonstrated an eight millimeter of available bone height due to proximity of the sinus floor and presence of excellent amount of bone width. While a short and wide dental implant can be placed in this site, it is certainly possible to develop the site further in order to accept a 10 millimeter implant, which offers us more surface area contact and benefits of long-term stability. Uh, this is particularly important in the posterior maxilla where the bone quality is often less ideal or in patients where we anticipate uh, greater occlusal forces. We also like to place the implant in single-stage fashion with the healing abutment, providing that we have achieved great implant stability. So our surgical objectives are to gain 3 to 4 millimeters of additional bone height and convert our bone quality, which is most likely a D3 or D4 bone, to a more dense D1 or D2 level. So I'm going to discuss the two techniques for achieving these objectives. First, we'll use osteodensification. It's a relatively new concept that, in my opinion, is one of the most exciting advances in implant site development. The technique involves the use of specially designed burrs that can be used for both osteotomy as well as osteodensification when used in reverse mode. It increases bone density at the osteotomy site expands the alveolar ridge where it may be thin, and it can also be used to increase the height of bone in the posterior maxilla by its sinus lift application. We'll also demonstrate the internal sinus lift technique using a series of sinus osteotomes. So here, we'll first create a mid-crestal incision and raise a very conservative submucoperiosteal flap. The initial osteotomy is done using our surgical guide and then verified with a guide pin and a periapical x-ray. We'll then continue the initial osteotomy using the osteodensification burr at about five to six millimeters depth, which is approximately three quarter of our available height of bone. Next, we'll use an internal sinus lift osteotome and displace the epical bone more superiorly to about the 10 millimeter mark. Then we'll place the osteodensification burr again in the reverse mode to densify the bone and expand it laterally and epically. We can also use it in the osteotomy mode to advance within the site if the bone is found to be uh, particularly dense. Then we'll place the next size sinus osteotome and raise the floor again. We go back again to the osteodensification burr and continue the osteotomy and the densification process using wider burrs 
slowly advancing it to about 12 millimeters. We'll go back and forth and keep raising the epical bone and densifying it in all directions until we have reached the right diameter and our desired height of about 12 millimeters. Using the densification burr in forward mode prepares a site removing bone from the lateral and epical sides and then immediately compacts it and moves it epically when it is reversed. Next, we'll place mineralized freeze-dry bone in the osteotomy site and push it toward the epical aspect of the osteotomy using a bone plugger. Then we'll use the last osteodensification burr in about 800 to 1000 RPM in reverse mode to drive and compact that bone uh, more epically and laterally. And this can be repeated again with additional amount of bone graft until the sufficient uh, augmentation uh, and lift has been accomplished. Next, we'll place the implant. While the implant was being rotated into position, a very high resistance was noted uh, when the implanted platform was about three to four millimeters from the crest. This was a reflection of the great density of bone, most likely a D1 at this time which we were able to achieve with the osteodensification process. To avoid excessive force and damage to the internal hex, the implant is backed out and removed. We'll then go ahead and modify the site further and prepare it for the implant using an implant bone tap. The bone tap is rotated until it's fully seated and then backed out. And then at this time, we can proceed with the placement of the implant until it is uh, seated fully. The healing abutment is also placed knowing that we have great primary stability with no concerns about occlusal loading on the healing abutment during its uh, healing phase. So here is our final implant in place and development of the epical bone beyond the implant apex. We'll allow the implant heal for about three to four months before its final uh, restoration. Also densification in combination with minor internal sinus lift technique is a great approach in managing sites in the posterior maxilla where augmentation of the vertical and horizontal bone is desired for improved implant stability and longevity. Thank you again for joining us today. <laughs> <laughs>